<clears throat> yes, it's the infamous coughing stream. Yes, I should go ahead and pull up. Yo. The hell? <clears throat> oh, damn, excuse me. <clears throat> Stream elements, what the hell was wrong with you? Still putting up your last message. Whatever am I gonna do to you? I mean, come on, Stream elements, get your act together. <laughs> I'm kinda watching Milk Chi Chi at the moment because she's still karaoke. Karaoke's fun. I would do karaoke except I suck at singing. <laughs> uh, why is it showing me? I got my closed captions turned off. Like, oh, two different options. Uh, anyway. <clears throat> oh, she's doing a last song. <clears throat> every breath you take, every move you make, every claim you stake, every vow you break, I'll be watching you. Every single day, I make my way. No, I don't like what the fun is I mean, I could switch over so you could hear what she's singing. Because, you know, I can't hear her. Is my own audio coming out? Hello? Ah, there we go. Yes. Okay, my audio's playing. I just gotta check Twitter to make sure it's actually doing its job. I'm not sure what song she's singing right now. I like it. 
Notifications and I wish I could get in good use of art book for me. Okay. Oh, oh. That's the one I did. Stream elements did not do their post. not come up with mine either. Oh well. <clears throat> Stream moments, you are sorely disappointing me. Ah. <clears throat> what is... Bridger, are you working? Let me fix Bridger real quick. Do, do, do. Do, do, do. Okay. Let me broadcast a studio instead. You switch to there. <coughs> So I'll put it this way. Settings. Yes. Yes, I'm using the paid version. Thank you for noticing. Okay. And connect. Ah, okay. My mouse does not respond nearly as much on this one. Boop. Okay. So, where are we? We're seven minutes in, so how you guys been doing this week? Uh, sorry I didn't, you know, I skipped the stream last week because I really didn't feel like reading, you know, Southland stuff. Yeah, I gotta turn on my audio because I can't hear myself, can't hear myself speak. I'm still listening to the sheet. I don't know what song that was, but it was a nice song. Okay. So, what time is it? <clears throat> We're only 10 minutes in. <clears throat> now, Cubs. I have something underworks. Ooh, my mom's energy. That I'm not sure if I'm going to use it yet. But it is something that I'm working on. And uh, since no one's here yet, 
I'm going to let you guys sneak in and see what's going on. Check this out. I've got a desk. <clears throat> oh, damn. Excuse me. I was thinking about using this as my new reading screen. I am going to try to put a background on and, you know, make it a little bit less dull. <clears throat> but, um, uh, if you look at my desk, it's kind of telling. I don't really guess people can see it that well. I'm not going to zoom in because I'm going to have to fix it later. But, wait, do I have a book on this desk? Hold on. Okay, the book's on it. I have my desk, my little book stand. Got my book on top of it. Because books are awesome. I recommend everyone read at least one or two a year, minimum. If you got the stuff I've been doing on screen, I've read 10 this year so far. More or less. But anyway, now this is just kind of a preview of what I was going to throw in next week. But you don't get that yet. Oh crap. Let's fix something here. Uh, I need my sound. Don't know if you can hear my sound or not. Ah, uh, there we go. Lovely sound of the library. But anyway, we are 12 minutes in. Okay, uh, yeah, where was I? <laughs> Reading. Uh... <coughs> oh. Now cast is on too. What the hell? And all these cute VTubers on the same time as me. Sucks. How am I supposed to watch them when I'm streaming? Unless I stream watching them, which would just be creepy. Okay. Oh well, we're almost 15 minutes in, so it's almost time that I have to get started. But hey, you got to see the preview of what I'm working on, so. I mean, preview. It's kind of a cool thing I want to do. I want to get my book up here, I want to get my desk. I'm going to have to find a chair. I'm going to try to get some candles on there, too, because. I like candles, but yeah. We're going back to this screen so we can read. So, yeah. Party time, excellence, Wayne's World. So, 
We are in the Southland. We're telling you the echoes of Southland. I need to fix something on my screen real quick. There's my chat window. It is weird. My chatters are weird. Oh, none of you that are here right now. <laughs> Right. Anyway, let's get into the book, shall we? Uh, sound bites are on if you want to get my attention, because I do use physical copies of the book, so I'm looking down at it a lot while I'm reading, so. Let's get into this, shall we? It's kind of appropriate that we got a cottony, since we're... Southland. Anyway. The South First Crop of Sugar by Charles Gare. Indigo had been the principal staple of the colony, but at last a worm which attacked the plant and destroyed it, though through consecutive years, was reducing to poverty and the utmost despair of the whole population. Jean Etienne de Bore determined to make a bold experiment to save himself and his fellow citizens and convert his indigo plantation into one of sugar cane. In these critical circumstances, he resolved to renew the attempt which had been made to manufacture sugar. He immediately prepared to go into all the expenses and to incur all the obligations consequent on so costly an undertaking. His wife warned him that her father had in former years vainly made a similar attempt. She represented she yeah, she represented that he was hazarding on the cast of a die that all that remained of their means of existence, that if he failed, as was so probable, he would reduce his family to hopeless poverty, and he was of an age, being over fifty years old, when fate was not to be tempted by doubtful experiments, as he should, could not reasonably entertain the hope of a sufficiently long life to rebuild his fortune if once completely shattered, and that he would not only expose himself to ruin, but also to a risk which much more is dreaded, that of falling into the grasp of debt creditors. Okay. Anything but creditors. <laughs> Friends and relatives joined their remonstra remonstrances to hers, but could not shake the strong resolve of his energetic mind. He had fully matured his plan and was determined to sink or swim with it. Purchasing a quantity of canes from two individuals named Mendez and Solis, who cultivated them only for sale as a dainty in the New Orleans market, and to make a coarse syrup, he began to plant. <coughs> in 1794, and to make all the necessary preparations, and in 1795, he made a crop of sugar which sold for $12,000, a large sum at the time. Boré's attempt had excited the keenest interest. Many had frequently visited him during his years to witness his preparations. Gloomy predictions had set, been set afloat, and on the day when the grinding of the cane was to begin, a large number of the most respectable inhabitants had gathered in and about the sugar house who to be present at the failure or success of his experiments. Would the syrup granulate? Would it be converted into sugar? The crowd waited with eager impatience for the moment when the man who watches the deco decoction of the juice of the cane determines whether it is ready to granulate. 
When that moment arrived, the stillness of death came among them, each one holding his breath, feeling that it was a matter of ruin or prosperity for them all. Suddenly, the sugar maker cried out with all exultation, It granulates! Inside and outside of the building, one could have heard the wonderful tidings flying from mouth to mouth and dying in the distance, as if a hundred glad echoes were telling to one another. Each one of the bystanders pressed forward as to ascertain the fact on the evidence of his own senses, and when it could no longer be doubted, there came a shout of joy and all flocked around Etienne de Boré, overwhelming him in congratulations and almost hugging the man whom they called their savior, the savior of Louisiana. And ninety years have elapsed since, and an event which produced so much excitement at the time is very nearly obliterated from the memory of the present generation. Yeah, it is. <clears throat> Hiding Places, More Time, by J.H. Score. Hmm. For some years after the close of our Civil War, the attention of our people was chiefly occupied with the study and recital of the most prominent battles, the decisive events, and the acts of famous officers. But when these bolder features of war panorama had been examined and discussed, more time was taken to look at some of the details, to call up the minor incidents, to bestow meed of praise upon privates, or to record the littles that made up their march. Oh, that's not a place. The sacrifices of the women and the children at home had been repeatedly referred to in general. But seldom do we see mention made of their daily provisions, and petty but continual annoyances to which they were subjected, and the struggle they made to sow and reap, as well as the difficulties they met having the harvested crops. The hiding places here described were all in one house. This house was in Virginia, near a town which changed hands under fire 82 times during the war, a town whose hotel register shows on the same page the names of officers of both armies, a town where there are two large cities of fallen soldiers, each is embellishment by the saddest of all epitaphs, to the unknown dead. Out of this battered town runs a number of turnpikes, and standing as close to one as these as the city house stands, the street was the house referred to, the home of a widow, three, cho three small children, a single domestic, and, for a part of the time, an invalid, an, an invalid cousin, whose ingenuity and skill fashioned the secret places, one of which was on several occasions his place of refuge. With fall came the fattening time for the hogs. They were then brought in from the distant fields where they had passed the summer, and put into a pen by the side of the road. And although within ten feet of the soldiers as they marched by, they were never seen, for the pen was completely covered by the winter's woodpile, except at the back, where there was a board fence through whose cracks the corn was thrown in. Whenever the passing advance guards told us that the army was approaching, the hogs were hurriedly fed so that the army might go by while they were taking their afternoon nap, and thus not reveal their presence by an escaped grunt or squeak. Fortunately, the house was situated in a narrow valley where the opportunities for bushwhacking were so great that the soldiers did not tarry long enough to search unsuspected woodpiles. On one occasion, we thought the hogs were doomed. A wagon broke down near the house, and a soldier went to the woodpile for a pole to be used in mending the brake. 
Luckily, he found a stick to his liking without tearing the wood pile to pieces. Now, this suggested that some nice straight pieces be always left conveniently near the top for such an emergency, in case it should ever occur again. The house had a cellar with a door opening directly out upon the big road, and never did a troop, large or small, pass by without countless soldiers seeking something edible from the most convenient cellar. It was never empty, but nothing was ever found. A partition had been run across about three feet from the back wall, so near that even a close inspection would not suggest a space back of it. And it was without a door. No one would think there was a room beyond. The only access to this back cellar was through a trap door in the floor of the room above. This door was always kept covered by a carpet, and in any case of danger was imminent, a lounge was to be put over this, and one of the boys, Fanning Onus, was put there, put to bed. In the cellar, apples, preserves, pickled pork, etc. were kept, and its existence was not known to any outside of the family. The two garrets of the house had false ends, with the narrow spaces beyond, where winter clothing, flour, corn, were safely stored. A partition in each of the weatherboarding, nailed on from the inner side so as to appear that the true ends, and, being in blind gables, there was no suspicion aroused by the absence of windows. The entrance to these little attics was through small doors that were part of the partition, and, as usual in country houses, the clothesline stretched across the end from one rafter to the other rafter, held enough old carpets and useful, useless stuff to silence any question of secret doors. Several closets were also provided with false backs, where the surplus linen of the household found a safe hiding place. In such an exposed place of country and scouts, or even a regiment, could appear so unexpectedly that it was necessary to keep everything out of sight. Even the provisions for the next meal had to be put away, or before the meal could be prepared, a party of marauders might drop in and carry off the entire supply. In the kitchen, a wood box of large size stood by the stove. It had a false bottom. In the upper part was the wood dirt, plentiful supply of chips, and so much stove wood that the impression would be conveyed that at least it was a good stock of fuel always on hand. The box was made of tongue grooved boards, and one of these on the floor could be slipped up, thus forming a door. Into this box all the food and the silverware were put. No little ingenuity was needed in making this convenience. The nails that were drawn out to let this board slip back and forth left telltale nail holes, but these were filled up with the heads of nails, so that no boards looked just alike. I remember once a soldier was sitting on this box while Mother was cooking for him, what seemed to be the last slice of bacon in the house. She was so afraid that he would drum on the box with his heels, as boys frequently do, and find that the box was hollow, that she continually asked him to get up while she took a piece of wood for the fire. It was necessary for, to disturb him a number of times before he found it advisable to take the proffered chair, and in the meantime a hotter fire had been made than the small piece of meat required. Of course, it was advisable to have at least scraps of wood food lying around. Their absence at any time would have aroused suspicion and started a search that might have disclosed all. The large loaves of bread were put in the unused bed in the place of bolsters. Money, when there was any on hand, was rolled up in a strip of cotton which was tied with a string around a bunch of whorehound that hung in a nail on the kitchen ceiling. The chickens were raised in a thicket some distance from the house, and being fed there, seldom left it. That's my chance.
Although this house was searched repeatedly, by night and by day, by regulars and by guerrillas, by soldiers in the north and the south, the only loss sustained were a few eggs, and this loss was not serious, for the eggs were stale. I don't see where the house is. That'd be kind of curious house to visit. The Sword of Robert E. Lee by Abram J. Ryan. Oh. Forth from its scabbard, pure and bright, flashed the sword of Lee. Far in the front of the deadly fights, high over the brave and the cause of right, that stainless sheen like a beacon light led us to victory. Did it? Out of its scabbard, where full long it slumbered peacefully, roused from its rest by battle song, shielding the feeble, smiting the strong, guarding the right, avenging the wrong, gleamed the sword of Lee. Forth from its scabbard, high in air, beneath Virginia's sky, and they who saw it gleaming there, and knew who bore it, knelt to swear. That where the sword led, they would dare to follow and to die. Out of its scabbard, never hand, wave sword from stand is free. No pure sword, but braver hand, no braver bled, a brighter land. Nor brighter land had a cause so great, nor a cause a chief like Lee. Forth from its scabbard, how we prayed, that sword might victor be, and when our triumph was delayed, and many a heart grew sore afraid, we still hoped for on while gleamed the blade of noble Robert Lee. Forth from the scabbard, all in vain, bright and flashed the sword of Lee, to shroud it now in its sheath again, as sleeps the sleep of our noble slain, defeated yet without a stain. Proudly and peaceably. Okay. And we have the last of them by O.P. Red. Or Reed. The Squatter. Once a famous in Arkansas, as who gave rise to the song and the dialogue of the Arkansas traveler, has almost entirely disappeared. Where his cabin stood, there is now a cotton factory, and at the forks of the road where his daughter Sal saw spurts, there is an academy for young women. The old men and the old women are asleep away off somewhere beneath the trees. And Sal's son is the prosecuting attorney of the district, and next year he may go on to Congress. I am inclined to believe that I saw or encountered would be better expression the very last of the genuine Arkansas squatters. A newspaper had sent me up among the hills to stir a sensation out of the alleged discovery of gold. And I was returning, horseback, when one evening, about an hour by sun, I came to a typical log house of the traditional squatter. I had long since lost the road and was simply riding at large. The squatter, with his wheat straw beard, his hay hair, and his autumn leaf complexion, was standing with his arms resting on the rail fence that made the pretense of surrounding his cabin. But I noticed that the fence was thrown down in several places, and that a skinny hog and a hip-shot cow wandered in and out as well. The old fellow nodded at my approach and immediately withdrew his attention from me, and I believe that he would have suffered me to pass without a word on his part. So careless was he, and so unconcerned with regard to the children of the world. But I drew rein and spoke to him and not ignorantly, for I knew his character. 
knew that to get directions from him, I must indeed be androids. How are you, sir? About the same. Fun weather. Sir Hearn. You live here, I suppose. I ain't died here. <laughs> I see. And I suppose you have been here long enough to give me directions to, as to the best way to reach Durandale Road. I am lost. When do you expect to find yourself? <laughs> That's what I don't know. But as soon as I start Gardendale Road, I'll know where I am. Don't you know where you are now? I must confess that I don't. <laughs> well, I'll tell you. I'll be much obliged to you. You're yeah, right here talking to me. <laughs> That's true, but where are you? That's the question. Why, I'm with you, he answered with a trawl. <laughs> I don't suppose there's any disputing with that fact, but I'd like to go to Darndale Road. Then why don't you? I will as soon as I can. There ain't nobody holding you. That's a fact, but I don't know which way to go. Go as you please. But that might not be right. Then turn to the left. Damn. <laughs> I saw that this attack was useless. So I thought I would try to affect his skillful flattery. Surely the old scoundrel had a weak place hidden somewhere. By the way, didn't I see you in Little Rock last winter? I don't know where you seed me last winter. Near summer before last. I didn't know, but I saw you in the state house. Weren't you in the legislature? Uh, it must have been my brother you seen. Was he in the legislature? No, in the penitentiary. That wouldn't do. I must try some other way. You look as if you might know a pretty good sort of man. I've had Lignan four times. Lignan. How did you lose it? <laughs> Cussing that cow again. And I wonder tell you she could snatch the lid out of the apostle Peter and the rest of it. She's a cashin. I mean you must be a good man physically, boxing and wrestling. I used to be, but since I broke my neck of the country judge and crippling the sheriff, who laughed Trasman. Well, I ain't prided myself much. I don't suppose you could be induced to show me how to get to that road. I'm afraid not. But do you think you are showing the Christian spirits? I don't reckon I am, but as I tell you, I ain't Christian since I lost my legend by cussing a cow. Damn. <laughs> Look here. The night is going to be fearfully dark. Are you going to see me sleep in the woods? I won't be there to see you. I'm half inclined to get down and take a fall out of you. I believe that I might possibly have a few rounds of five his weak spots, his old eyes bright. Partner, get down and look at your saddle, won't you? I dismounted, tied my horse, and told him I was ready. And with many a capering duddyish for an older fellow, he came toward me. He wrapped his long arms about me and told me to help myself. He laughed long with a strange glee. He swore that he hadn't been so happy since he broke the neck of the county judge. I clutched him and began to struggle, and the pretense of exerting my might to throw him down, but in reality looking out of place would fall. And I did fall. Got enough? the old rascal asked, the yellowish grin spreading broadcast over his face. Yes, plenty, I answered. I know when I have enough. I can tell him, I can tell a man as soon as I put my hands on him. And I want to say without shame either that you are the first man that's thrown me since I reached my prime. You talk of throwing the county judge. Why well, not long ago I threw a circuit judge? You don't tell me, he cried, his eyes sparkling. Yes, I do tell you, and it's a fact. Furthermore, I believe you can throw down the supreme judge of the state. 
He put his head affectionately on my shoulder. Partner, he said, lifting up his head to wipe his eyes. You ain't gonna leave me tonight. It's gonna rain, and there ain't a house over yonder on that road. I'll give you the best on the place, and tomorrow morning, I'll take you that road, mother. He yelled at his wife, who had appeared from the doorway. Kill the finest chicken you got. Get your Sunday stuff. For the Progdition son is here. And I am not full of Arkansas squatters. I'm sorry. <laughs> not gonna walk the tenant point necessary. One. Mm, dark chocolate. I like partaking in things that should kill wolves. Dark chocolate, caffeine, alcohol. I'm trying to get orange and blue and brandy. Yeah. Mm. <sighs> Tasty stuff. Anyway, Cubs. Yep, cool. My Early School Days by Booker T. Washington. From the time that I can remember having any thoughts about anything, I recall that I had an intense longing to learn to read. I determined, when quite a small child, that if I accomplished nothing else in life, I would in some way get enough education to enable me to read common books and newspapers. Soon after we got settled in some manner in our new cabin in West Virginia, I induced my mother to get a hold of a book for me. How or where she got it, I do not know, but in some way she procured an old copy of Webster's Blueback Dick Spelling Book, which contained the alphabet, followed by such meaningless words as ab, ba, ka, da. I began to once to devour this book and I think that it was the first one I ever had in my hands. I had learned from somebody that the way to begin to read was to learn the alphabet. So I tried in all the ways I, I could think of learn, to learn it. Oh, of course, without a teacher. For I could find no one to teach me. At that time, there was not a single member of my race anywhere near who could read and I was too timid to approach any of the white people. In some way, within a few weeks, I mastered the greater portion of the alphabets. In all my efforts to learn to read, my mother shared fully my ambition and sympathized with me and aided me in every way that she could. Though she was totally ignorant, so far as mere book knowledge was concerned, she had high ambitions for her children and a large fund of good, hard, common sense that seemed to enable her to meet and master every situation. If I had done anything in life worth attrition, worth attention, I feel sure that I inherited this disposition from my mother. About this time, the question of having some kind of a school opened, and the colored children of the village began to discuss by members of the race. As it would be the first school for Negro children that had ever been opened in that part of Virginia. It was, of course, to be a great event, and the discussion excited the widest interest. The most perplex perplexing question was where to find a teacher. In, our, in the midst of the discussion about our teacher, a young colored man from Ohio, who had been a soldier, in some way found his way into town. It was soon learned that he possessed considerable education and was engaged by the colored people to teach their first school. As yet, no free schools had been started for colored people in that selection. Hence, when the family agreed to pay a certain amount per month, with the understanding that the teacher was to board round, that is, spend a day with each family, 
This was not bad for the teacher. For each family tried to provide the very best on the day the teacher was to be guest. I recall that I looked forward to that anxious appetite to Teacher's Day in our little cabin. This experience as a whole race began, beginning to go to school for the first time presents one of the most interesting studies that has ever occurred in connection with the development of any race. Few people who were not right in the midst of the scenes can form the exact ideas of the intense desire which the people of my race showed towards an education. As I have stated, it was a whole race trying to go to school. Few were too young and none too old to make an attempt to learn. As fast as any kind of teachers could be scurred, secured, not only were day schools filled, but night schools as well. The great ambition of the older people was to try to learn to read the Bible before they died. With this end in view, men and women who were 50 or 75 years old would often be found in the night school. Sunday schools were formed soon after freedom, and the principal book studied in the Sunday school was the spelling book. Day school, night school, Sunday school were always crowded, and often many had to be turned away for the want of room. When, however, I found myself at the school for the first time, I also found myself confronted with two difficulties. In the first place, I found that all the other children wore hats or caps on their heads, and I had neither a hat nor cap. In fact, I do not remember that up to the time of going to school, I had ever worn any kind of covering on my head, nor do I recall that either I or anybody else had even thought about something, given the needs covering for the head. But of course, when I saw how the other boys were dressed, I began to feel quite uncomfortable. As usual, I put the case before my mother, and she explained to me that she had no money with which to buy a store hat, which was a rather new institution at the time among the members of my race, and was considered quite the thing for young and old to own, but that she would find a way to help me out with the difficulty. She accordingly got two pieces of homespun jeans and sewed them together, and I was soon the proud possessor of my first cap. The lesson that my mother taught me in this has always remained with me, and I have tried as best I could to teach it to others. I have always felt proud, whenever I think of the incident, that my mother had the strength of character not to be led into the temptation of seeming to be that which she was not of trying to impress my schoolmates and others with the fact that she was able to buy me a store hat and she was not. I have always felt proud that she refused to go into debt for that which she did not have the money to pay for. Since that time, I have owned many kinds of caps and hats, but never one of which I have felt proud of as the cap made with two pieces of cloth sewed together by my mother. I have noticed the fact, but without satisfaction, I need not add that several boys who began their careers with store hats and who were in my schoolmates used to join the sport that was made of me because I only had a homespun cap, have ended their careers in the penitentiary, while others are not able to buy any kind of hats. My second difficulty was the regard to my name, or rather a name. From the time when I could remember anything, I had simply been called Booker. Before going to school, it had never occurred to me that it was needful or appropriate to have an additional name. When I heard the school roll called, I noticed that all the children had at least two names, and some of them indulged in what seemed to be an extra, in the extravagance of having a three. I was in deep perplexity because I knew that the teacher would demand of me at least two names, and I only had one. By the time the occasion came for the roll calling of my name, an idea occurred to me which I thought would make me equal to the situation. And so, when the teacher asked me what my full name was, I calmly told him Booker Washington, as if I had been called my name that all my life. 
and by the name that I had since been known. Later in life, I found that my mother had given me the name Booker Talaferro soon after I was born. But in some way, that part of my name seemed to disappear. And for a long while, it was forgotten. But as soon as I found about it, I revived it and made my full name Booker Taliaferro Washington. I think that there are not many men in our country who have had the privilege of naming themselves in the way that I have. I named myself. The time I was permitted to attend school during the day was short, and my attendance was irregular. It was not long before I had to stop attending day school altogether and devote all my time again to work. I resorted to the night school again. In fact, the greater part of my education that secured in my boyhood was gathered through the night school after my day's work was done. I had difficulty often in securing a satisfactory teacher. Sometimes, after I had secured someone for, to teach me for nights, I would find, much to my disappointment, that the teacher knew but little more than I did. Often, I would have to walk several miles at night in order to recite my night school lessons. There was never a time in my youth, no matter how dark and discouraging the days might be, when one's resolve did not continually remain with me, and that was the determination to secure an education at any cost. Education is more important to some people than others, clearly. Modern kids are spoiled to the fact that education is available. Then there's me, reading to modern kids. So, church. Honestly, if I could figure out a way to make this uh, read along rather than just me reciting or reading from a book, I'd consider it. But my talents are not that vast yet. Anyway, Primus gets his freedom. By Walter Hines Page. <clears throat> I'm enjoying the Star Trek too much. Sorry, hold on. Primus was 24 years old when the war ended and said he was set free. He had spent the first half of his life on a plantation of old Vester Thomas, chiefly as cowboy and as scullion. He drove the cows from pasture to a lot and from the lot again to the pasture. He hauled wood from the new ground and made fires in the morning in the big house. And he kept the cook's chip box full of chips and went on errands for her. He had seldom been off the plantation, except with his mother to the country church two miles away. When he was about thirteen, the young master, Craig Thomas, was married and Primus was given to him as a wedding present. There was, therefore, a double sorrow in the room house when Frank Thomas went away from his father's to his own small plantation, twenty-five miles away. Sorrow for the departure of the young master, and sorrow for the departure of Primus. Primus himself, however, felt rather proud of going away. He and Mars... No. He and Marster Frank were now going to begin life for themselves. He felt, in fact, quite as important as if he were to be a bridegroom of a new plantation belonged to him. At any rate... He would be a sort of silent partner. Morris Frank had always known him, and the Negroes that came to the new 
home with the bride were strangers to the master. Then, too, Primus knew and, knowing, rejoiced that he was the best in dignity of being a scullion and cowboy. At the new home, he was made a plowboy during the busy season, and other times he cut food for the stock, feed the cattle, and groom the carriage horses. For two years before the war ended, he had been Messus, Mrs. Frank Thomas' carriage driver. When the slaves were freed, Primus at first did not fully understand what freedom meant. He had never been a slave driven or badly used. He had associated much with his master, his mistress, their children, and kinspeople, and acknowledged no lower association than the horses. He was black, robust, honest, because he had always been well-fed, well-clothed, and trusted, and proud. Freedom sat upon him like a new garment, indeed. His master came home a few days after Johnson's surrender and found Primus, and one of the other two slaves as obedient to the mistress as if they had still been slaves. The stock on the farm had been taken away by the soldiers of either army, the cattle had been butchered, and not a sufficient crop had been planted. Mr. Thomas one morning called Primus and the other Negroes before the front door of the big house and explained to them the situation, that they were free. He had nothing. They were at liberty to go away if they wished. If they wished to stay, he would be glad. Somebody must be hired to do the work of the farm. They would try to get the work aggling in a few weeks. They should be paid in money for the, or in shares of crop, whatever was fair, and should, be, should become customary. There was yet no money in the country, and he didn't know what labor would be worth. The Negroes only understood half of it all, and withdrew any of the more puzzled over the strange situation. But it seemed to be understood that they would remain. Three nights later, however, Primus went into the kitchen, stealthily took a piece of bread and meat, and wrapped it up carefully in a second coat. He had but two coats, one pair of trousers, one pair of shoes, and one hat. He then softly, then he went softly to the back door of the big house, and called little... Lucy Thomas to the door. If I tell you something, Miss Lucy, won't you tell nobody? Well then, I'm going away tonight. Don't never tell your pa. Bye, Miss Lucy. That night, feeling like a thief, and yet feeling sure that he was doing right, Primus walked 15 miles to Raleigh. Freedom, he thought, meant a right to do as one pleased, and if released for Mr. Thomas's, would not would it not appear that he was free. Ooh. It was a new venture in life, without a dime, with enough meat and bread only for one more meal, and now his breakfast was eaten, without acquaintances in the town that to him was as vast as London itself would have been, what should he do? At times, a fear would come that, if caught, he would be forcibly carried back to Mr. Thomas's. And then the new idea, yet only fitfully realized, would sue them. That he was free and could go where he pleased. That other idea also came, namely, that now he had only himself to depend on. He ate dinner. Where would he get supper and where should he sleep? There are hundreds of other Negroes in the town much more lamentable situations. He had no doubt, but his reflection did not in any way console him. Probably they knew someone. Probably they had some money. Probably they knew how to get work. Primus ventured to ask one robust fellow who lounged about one of the town pumps what he did. Do? Do nothing. Sir old fool nigger, as a free man, I is. Ain't you drawed your rations yet? I don't work for nobody, Primus said. Work? What are you going to work for? Ain't the government giving us rations? Go to the bureau. Wow. Primus found out what this bureau was, where it was, 
They took an oath that he did not understand, was told that he was free, and given a piece of bacon and a peck of meal. They found a shanty in the outskirts of town, where he was taken in for the night by a half dozen Negro men and women and allowed to cook his rations. The men and women did not own the shanty. Indeed, they had never known another until one, they met one chance, and one another by chance as promised, had met them. But they all drew rations, and were all free. The next day he went to the town, disgusted. True, he was free, but idle. No, but idle, wicked negroes, like his newly made acquaintances, had no very strong attractions for him. Morris Frank had said that they must all work, though they were free. And Primus was a simple, honest fellow, good purposes and good impulses. Attracted by a number of fine-looking horses at the pump, he asked the, host, the hoster and crews they were. Government horses. They followed them to the stables, made an application to drive one of the wagons. He was hired and promised fifteen dollars a month in rations. With horses, he was at home, and all summer he drove the government wagon. Of course, he learned many things during these months. He understood the in a vague way what the government was, and what the bureau, which was his only commissary of the military post, where food was for months given to the poor freemen. And he learned much about the men and things that had been strange for him. Several times he saw Mr. Thomas in town, but he always drove out of sight of his old master. The memory of the theft of bread and meat, which probably had never been missed or missed only by the old cook and his ungallant departure in the night, took away his first bold resolution to speak to him. One day, however, Mrs. Thomas and Lucy drove into town in the old carriage, drawn by now by two mules. Promise tied his old team and stood by the carriage until they came to the shop where they were buying the first dry goods that they ever spent greenbacks for. When they approached the carriage, Promise took his hat in hand, motioned to the boy that drove it to hold the mules, and politely opened the door and handled, handed in the bundles. Can that boy drive here? he asked, and while waiting for an answer, Primus examined the harness of the mules with much ado and much of the disgust of the boy. <coughs> Why don't you come to see us, Primus? Hi, hi, what old Mars? Be glad to see me. We've all got to work again, and seems like most old times, Mrs. Thomas answered. And Mr. Thomas will be glad to have you with him. <coughs> I'm coming, sure as you're born. The conversation strengthened Primus's resolution, at least to make his old master make his old master visits, and the next Sunday morning, astride the government horse, he rode toward the old country place to see his old master, and was overjoyed to find him, find out that his sins had not been remembered against him. The truth is, the circumstances of his going away had hardly been noticed at the time, except by little Lucy, and had long ago been forgotten. So great was his gladness as he sat on Sunday afternoon on the front steps, with his hat in his hand, telling Mr. and Mrs. Thomas of the life of the city, that he could not help asking if he was not again wanted. He had bargained to come the next day and to work for ten dollars a month, with the privilege of eating in the kitchen. True to his word, he went back to the next afternoon and began to work in his old home. Again, it seemed as if he were half-owner, and he was delighted to tell Miss Lucy about her father's marriage, and the important part he took in the first settling of his place. That was before you were born. This was before you were born. What I was thinking about. A month passed, and Primus was paid ten dollars. Now it was better to eat in the kitchen than to cook his own rations in town. But ten dollars are less than fifteen, and the country is rather lonesome. So Primus calmly concluded that he was a fool to work for ten dollars when he could get fifteen. And he was a free man. The next day, therefore, he went away again, failing to tell anyone, even Miss Lucy, 
He felt somewhat ashamed of himself at times, but he easily argued to himself and believed that Monster Frank was cheating him out of five, out of five dollars a month. So he went to the city, not as a stranger now, nor without a sense, but again without work. He sought work, but somehow he had found nothing to do until his money was all gone. He smoked cigars for two or three days, talked with old acquaintances about the advantages of living in the city. Another Negro now drove the team that he had felt in his own property a month ago. He got a recommendation, however, from the government officer, and the day after again, the pauper he secured work as a trade driver. Promise was an industrious and trustworthy manager of horses. He took a jockey's and a groom's pride in them, and really one of the best drivers in the city. In a few weeks, his employer advanced his wages from $12 to $15 a month, and he felt himself vindicated for leaving his old master. He was a bachelor and lived in a cabin in what was called Egypt, in the suburb of the town where only Negroes lived. <clears throat> it had been built up on a plot of an old fairground, where no owners had yet disturbed the squatters. By the white men, he was held in high esteem for two reasons. He was polite, and he could be trusted as a groom and driver. He never met a white man that he respected without lifting his hat when he bowed, and he never failed to receive in turn the polite recognition. This politeness was not serv servile. It was simply a good manners, and he was learned while he had been slave of Morris Frank. Happily, it never occurred to him, even in the first foolish days of his freedom, that freedom meant a right to be rude. Indeed, Primus had the dignified manners of a gentleman of the old school. He could do a kindness with more cheerful grace and receive a benefit with no more dignified attitude than his young master. No Negro, therefore, was held in higher esteem than his white neighbors than Primus. His friends of his own race, too, regarded him as a man of importance, man of influence with white men, and man of sound judgment. Although he had sometimes been taunted with too familiarity with white men, too great servility to them be less polite and less successful Negroes, who were perhaps envious of his influence, he was really a staunch friend of his race, an ardent Republican, and in a quiet way even a politician. When the League was first organized in Egypt, he listened attentively to the organizer who, when he provided from the scriptures that the colored men must unite for their own protection and must vote Republican ticket or again be enslaved. This later doctrine at first caused much speculation in his mind. He was very sure that the organization was desirable and it seemed proper to vote for the men that had set him free. But he could not believe that Master Frank, Master Frank, would make him a slave again. Yet Master Frank was a Democrat. After a deal of thought and several conversations with the organizer of the league, he concluded that there were a few good men as his old master, who that were Democrats in general. If they had power, would in some way do his race an injury. He did not know just what injury would do or why they would do an injury at all, but, well, General Grant was a great hero. Everything was done in his name, and with mere mention of his old name, always stirred Promise's blood. Just as his time, Promise ha happened to be an officer of the League. A meeting was held Sunday night, after preaching to Ebenezer, to make arrangements for celebrating the 4th of July. The day was a particularly important day for Primus, for he graced an important position. Decorated with a red sash and blue rosette, he marched at the head of the procession as banner bearer, and as banner bearer, he sat on the platform while all the speeches were made. Two or three days later, when it was very warm and horses and driver were both irritable, he was driving a heavy load up the hill in the city. A lazy white lad leaped out the dray, and Primus angrily ordered him to leap down. When he hesitated, Primus struck him with a whip and drew blood from his cheek. The boy answered the blow with a stone. The five followed, and the boy sounded flogged. 
Of course, a crowd of boys and men gathered, some asking questions, others making explanations, and others cursing. The mother of the bleeding lad, with an energy of anger, asked the men if they would stand by and see a negro beat a white child almost to death. Then a policeman led Primus to the police station and locked him in. It was soon whispered about town that a black rascal had struck a white boy, and an indignation was made greater by the fact that Primus had walked high and proud on the 4th of July as a banner bearer of the league. Although he had been held in particularly high esteem, it was easily concluded by his white friends that he too had been made foolish by the league, for a nigger will be a nigger, you know. The next day, he was tried for assault and battery. The mother of the assaulted and battered boy insisted that her son would carry the scar to his grave, and those who saw the fight swore that Primus struck the boy, struck the first blow. They were sentenced, therefore, to imprisonment for thirty days. After the sentence had been delivered, a gentleman whose horse had been stolen referred to th thefts of the charge of theft against the prisoner. The stolen horse had been found near the house of Primus's stepfather, and it was known that Primus went there on the night of the theft. When his thirty days' imprisonment would have been expired, he was therefore also tried for the stealing of the horse. During Primus's imprisonment, under the suspicion of horse theft, it seems to be taken for granted that he was guilty. For the finding of the horse near his stepfather's lonely hut and his sudden visits there on the night of which the stolen horse was stolen, was circumstantial evidence. But the day before this trial was held, his truant brother, whose very existence Primus had forgotten, was tried for stealing the hog, a swinish diversion to which it, he seemed addicted, and incidentally during the trial was unwittingly confessed that he had stolen the horse. He was convicted and sent to the penitentiary for a short term of years, and Primus, of course, was acquitted. He received the congratulations of his friends and spent the first days of his freedom boasting on his character. He was very sure if a horse should ask to be stolen and insist on it without earning a name, he was persuaded that its present owner that it was not only its legal owner, but also its moral guardian. But after a few days he became hungry and hunger suggested work. He easily found employment and in a week he had almost forgotten that anything unusual had happened and everybody else had forgotten as well. After several weeks of forgetfulness, one day Primus met his young master in town and was told that Miss Lucy had been married. Great Caesar, he had forgotten all about it. When was that? he asked. July 14th, a month ago. Lord, Lord, I wish I could have been there. Primus sighed and made an excuse to end the conversation that would never lead to a pleasant subject for the wedding had been celebrated while he was in prison. No sooner had he left young Mr. Thomas, however, than he began to reproach himself for his abruptness. What did Mr. Thomas think of the trial? Did he know that all the circumstances? And believe that Primus was innocent? His abrupt avoidance of the subject would leave an unfavorable impression on the dead man's mind. It was an unpleasant fear that followed him for several days that both his young and old master would lose confidence in him, and now he was sure that he prized their good opinion much more highly than, than the verdict of the jury and the good opinions of the public. These reflections and this fear caused him to make a firm resolution never again to join the procession of the League, and indeed never again be the conspicuous of politics for that unlucky prominence of the 4th of July was the cause of all his misfortune. He withdrew from the League. Of course, his associates protested, but when he assured them that his own conviction had not changed, and that he would always vote for Republican candidates, he resigned. His resignation was accepted. But he lost the favor of his fellow citizens in Egypt. Even some became his enemies. They hinted that it was believed that he had stolen the horse. Others were sure that he had been bought by the Democrats and was a traitor. Recently, one of the most popular citizens of Egypt, he was now suddenly become one of the most unpopular. On the sudden, too, 
There had sprung up in Egypt an arrogant but aristocracy, a class of freemen who loved to suppose that they and all their kinspeople were well bred and now had been owned and reared by their aristocratic masters. Now, Promise's master had been an aristocrat, but the farmer master. The former master of Primus' stepfather, who was now recognized as the head of the family, was one of the most despicable men in the county. Since his marriage, his stepfather had subsequently spent his Sundays in Egypt and had made himself a social nuisance. To all these social misfortunes, Primus was very sensitive. And he felt with pain that his old on the community was weakened. And now the political campaign was at an exciting height, and the white men under its influence were much less cordial than usual in their manner toward blacks. The few blacks who had declared that they would vote for Democratic candidates were the favorites of the town, and all others were regarded with suspicion. It so happened, too, that just as the prime time Primus was in the employment of the very violent of the Democrats, who was a candidate with little hope of election for the seat of the legislature. One day he asked Primus whether he would vote for it. No, sir, I cannot do it. His place was immediately given to a Democratic Negro. His discharge was, for a purely political reason, was not commended by public sentiment, but unhappily, public sentiment he hardly, hardly became aware of it. Primus had little to say about it, and it was soon forgotten. He was not of an aggressive or vindictive humor, and cared too little for politics to play the martyr. This was an excellent opportunity to regain the confidence of the League and of his political friends, but he was not inclined to use it. In his despondency, he regarded it only as another punishment for his indiscreet prominence on the 4th of July, and his resolution became stronger again to never take part in the political display. He was now out of employment and out of favor, and for the first time in his life he feared that he could not get work to do. In fact, he had lost his courage. He wished to go away from Raleigh and from Egypt, and to leave his misfortunes behind him and begin with life anew. His old stepfather had told him that his young mistress had inherited the old Thomas plantation, and that she and her husband had gone to live there. Promise forthwith sold his share of the hut in Egypt, where he had lived for so long time, packed with all his worldly goods in an old carpet bag, and walked to the old place where he had begun life as a scullion and cowboy. Although it was the wrong season of the year to pick seek employment on the prim, on the farm. Primus felt sure that he would be given work to do, and the memories of his childhood and the relief of the unpleasant surroundings of Egypt and in the Raleigh gave him great comfort. Indeed, he loved the old place so much that he felt he had right to expect a home there. Just before night, he entered the kitchen and introduced himself to the cook. If a volley of inequities, inquiries about the people in the place may be called an introduction, their conversation was soon interrupted by the appearance of Miss Lucy, as her servants continued to call her. Don't you remember promise, Miss Lucy? Has come for, has come to see you again. Was his somewhat embarrassed self-introduction. Her inquiries about his life and answers to his questions about her marriage assured him that he was welcome. So after supper, and promise ate in the kitchen with the cook. He knocked on the back door of the big house, and when Miss Lucy appeared, he asked her to see the husband. Leaving his hat on the old stone steps, he went in and stood near the door just outside the library, transforming his whole countenance into a respectful grin. I've made many a fire in that fireplace, he said, <laughs> with abrupt pleasantries. And then he spoke enthusiastically of the improvements that the new owner had made on the place predicted endless prosperity, and was mighty glad to see Miss Lucy, whom he'd known for, known as her little gal, so fine and happy, and ran the old house where her grandmother lived. 
Then, in a tone suddenly changed from compliments to great soberness, he asked whether he could work on the farm. At the recollection of his recent misfortunes, Primus trembled while he waited for an answer that seemed to be very slowly made. Did they think he had stolen the horse? Well, Primus, where have you been living? What have you been doing since I saw you in town last summer? Primus trembled still more. His determination never to allude to the misfortune broke down. I'll tell you all about it, Miss Orson. See, first of all, that white boy was impudent trash. I didn't go for, to hurt him so bad. Then them, them back the horse. Don't you suppose I done that? <clears throat> what is all this? Then Promise understood in an instant what an embarrassing mistake he had made. Was William had never heard of the glory or his shame. He knew nothing of the imprisonments and the trial, and was never heard that his brother was in the penitentiary. Anyhow, I was tired of them bothered politicals and fine niggers in town. And when I heard you come to the old place, I says to myself, I'm going there and work again. <laughs> A satisfactory bargain was made, and promise was to remain, at least until Christmas, to drive the wagon to do general work about the farm. After a residence of three or four months in the old plantation, Primus forgot his old troubles, and, having kept his resolution never to have nothing more to do with her wild politics, he led a very industrious and quiet life. In October, the annual big meeting was begun at Shiloh, the church for colored people was of the neighborhood. This meeting always continued a week since unfortunate efforts was made to convert every center in the neighborhood. One of the first conversions made was the conversion of Dinah, the cook, on the last day of meeting Primus was converted. He was not so boisterous as Dinah then, but he explained to the brethren in an earnest way that his charge of heart and expressed the noblest resolution to lead an exemplary life. He and Dinah, therefore, became brother and sister in church. Two weeks later, the preacher declared them man and wife, and the marriage was prosperous, we contracted and registered in the office of the county clerk. A few months later, delegates were appointed from all the churches of the state to the church conference. Which was held in Wellington. Naturally, Primus was one of the delegates chosen at Shiloh. He obtained permission from his employer to be absent a week, borrowed ten dollars from him to supplement the amount that had been collected to cover his expenses, and as the brother from Shiloh, he was a prouder man and as a banner bearer of the league on the fourth of July. In less than a year he was eschewed politics and become a leader in a more nobler warfare. He had passed from jail to general conference. And that was uh, a lot longer than I expected to read. I need another piece of jump up to that. No, I didn't think about my sack twist before, whatever. Probably a good reason I titled this Not So Comfy Stories. Was, some people would be. You know, probably insulted by some of this.
just says, and you know, someone will probably be done by this next thing in here, which is a poem. But as I am sworn not to censor or sugarcoat. I will continue reading. Mm. Despite my own personal annoyance at the subjects. This is a poem called The Old Time Darky by Josie Frazy Kaplan. They're going fast, they're going. From the old time cabin door, and the places now that knows that know them will know them soon no more. I, the uncle and the auntie, with a bygone sins will be, and no more Mars or Mrs. will come to you and me. No more the crooning Mamie, softly swaying to and fro, with her love unchanging and daring, or the Southlands we once know. No more of that careless sing song in measure quaint and droll. It will overflow from hearts so happy till the music seemed each soul. No more admiration on that darky pride so great, and all the fleecy acres of his master's vast estate. No more fond affection for that household on the hill, for the trusty old time darky. Had no equal, ne'er will. No more joy in that wildness, that rustic race are new. When the Christmas feasts were ready, and that day no work to do. Or the marriage of young misses to the magnet of the land, when the darkie shared the glory of the bravest of the band. No more the grief the prone foundest. When old Mars or Mrs. died, or the baby from the big house was lowered by the side. For the dark he mourned them truly, for the master and his kind. As the faithful and the animals of grief we never find. And to me, one old black auntie still was spared the brief of her days, and I often silence wonder. By her dear old darky ways. Still when sickness comes or sorrow, other friends may faint and fall. The black mammy never falters. She is faithful through it all. With her heart surcharged with sorrow, do I watch them pass away. For the old south, for the old south with them endeth, and new assumes its way. With the passing of the darky, of that good old golden time, so path it out forever, that fair puck of our time. <clears throat> Good word. Things is starting to bug me. They're already an yeah, hour and a half, so I should be fine. <clears throat> Eulogy of Flacco, Chief of the Lippets, by Sam Houston. Hey. My brother, my heart is sad, 
Dark cloud rests upon our nation. Grief has sounded in your camp. The voice of Flacco is silent. His words are not heard in the council. The chief is no more. His life has fled to the great spirits. His eyes are closed. His heart no longer leaps at the sight of the buffalo. The voices of your camp are no longer heard to cry. Flacco has returned to the chase. Your chiefs look down upon the earth and groan in trouble. Your warriors weep. The loud voice of grief is heard from your women and children. The song of birds is silent. The ears of your people no hear, hear no pleasant sound. Sorrow whispers in the winds. The noise from the tempest passes and is not heard. Your hearts are heavy. The name of Flacco brought joy to their hearts. Joy was on every face. Your people were happy. Flacco is no longer seen in the fight. His voice is no longer heard in battle. The enemy no longer make path for his glory. His valor is no longer regard for your people. The right of your, the right arm of your nation is broken. Flacco was a friend to his white brothers. They will not forget him. They will remember the Red Warrior. Father will not be forgotten. We will be kind to the Lippins. Grass shall not grow on the path between us. Let your wise men counsel peace. Let your young men walk in the white path. All gray-headed men of your nation will teach wisdom. I will hold my red brother by the hand. Thy brother, Sam Houston, Washington, March 28th. 1843. I'm not going to sing this one. That's a song. Look, I'm missing it anyway. Song of the Forerunners by Mrs. Carl Wilson Baker. The men who made Texas rode west with dazzled eyes on the hot trail of the future to take her by surprise. They were dreamers on horseback, dreamers of strong hands, trailing the golden lion who crouches in far lands. Old men and young men, little men and tall, bad men and good men, but strong men all. The women who bore Texas could see beyond the sun. They were they sat on cabin doorsteps when the long day was done. And they crooked to lusty babies, and it's, but their look was far away, for they gazed straight through the sunsets to the unborn day. Stern women, laughing women, women stout or small, bronze women, broken women, brave women all. The men who made Texas laughed at fate and doom, dreamers on horseback, men who needed room. And the women and young Texans, hanging hunts on close and dry, loved the prairie for door yard, from meeting house to sky. Wide visions, wide spaces, man and land were large, blown. Texas knew not cheap and easy, slack and small when she was young. But the men who made Texas left their work half done, for nothing stands full finished beneath the spinning sun. And the women who dreamed Texas had much work to do when they lay down for their last sleep in land still new. And yet bright old Texas, cloud paved and glimmer, burns yet before the eyes of us who toil and dream the same. <clears throat> okay, yeah, I'm gonna stop there. <laughs> oh, we did. Let's see, a certain page 188, and then one, two, three, six. Uh. <clears throat> I apologize for being a short stream, people. But, uh, yeah. I really. Where am 
myself how to think about those things. Some of it's nice, though. <coughs> Again, it is a short stream. Uh, I want to thank anyone who popped in merch. You know what I'm saying? I didn't see anyone come in, but you know, I usually don't. <laughs> So now it's about doing story streams is I'm staring at the book most of the time. Well, let's see. Who is on that we might read? Yeah, on Haro's on. I haven't had a chance to read on Haro for a while, so let's see that. That is Pokemon Breeder on Haro. Looks like he's. Oh. Looks like he's playing with Riley. So, yeah. That's. Go harass them for a little while. Give them a follow, get them whatnot. That kind of thing. So. Oh, where's my ending? Oh, there's my ending stream. Okay. Again, uh, thank you all for listening. Sorry I had to torch you, but. You know, it's what happens. We'll be back with more fables tomorrow. Then I'll be at a con over the weekend. So, yeah. Uh, let's do that raid. So, uh, having a good night, Cubs. Let's go scare some people. Night. <laughs>